In this video, we want to conclude our discussion of stock valuation with a, a, a theory, a hypothesis, that's referred to as the efficient market hypothesis. So here's the issue at place. Market prices are determined by investors through the supply-demand mechanism. Intrinsic values come from the information about the company. And that's really the critical word there, information. What kinds of information creates intrinsic value? There are two basic categories. There's public information that all investors know, but then there's also private information. The intrinsic value will rarely ever be equal to the market prices because there is information that the public does not know. And quite frankly, corporations don't want us to know everything that goes on inside the company. They have pr proprietary interests in their research and development, in their strategies. So they want to keep some of those things secret within inside the company. So the question is, how, how do we know prices are in equilibrium, right? So the mic, again, we said the market price must be at the security's intrinsic value if it is at equilibrium. So what does equilibrium mean? Essentially, that just says that there is, no, there is no event or there's no knowledge that we know that would change the current value, right? So the price is currently unaffected by anything that we can think of. Again, the question in the end is, how long, how far away from market price is the intrinsic value? How, do, how is equilibrium established? Well, if the market price is less than the intrinsic value, or if the expected return is above the required return, then we would say this stock is a bargain. It, is, it shows an opportunity to purchase, and then when the rest of the world figures out the correct price, the intrinsic value, then obviously we will gain value. We will make some money on our investment. So buy orders typically exceed sell orders. That builds up the price. That moves us again so that the price moves towards the intrinsic value. Again, just said another way, profitable trading is going to continue then until the market price is equal to the intrinsic value. And of course, the opposite would occur if the price were on the other side. So how do we get price to move? We get price to move by getting information. And that's really what the efficient market hypothesis is all about. It asserts that when new information arise, arrives, prices are going to move to that new equilibrium price very quickly. Why does that happen? Or why do we think that happens? There are lots of people looking for mispriced securities. New information is available to almost everybody. Certainly it's available to all professional traders. So when mispricing occurs, because of new information or maybe even inefficient markets, Analysts have billions of dollars to use to take advantage of this. And of course, the price very quickly changes. So what's the implication of this efficient market hypothesis? Stocks are normally in equilibrium. What that means for an investor is you cannot beat the market. That is, by consistently earning a return higher then justified by the stock's price. So whatever the price is, that's the value of the stock. If you buy it, there's no potential for, in, in quotes, beating the market. Now, that doesn't mean you won't earn a return. It means you will not be able to exceed 
the marketplace itself or the markets. So how can we test this efficient market hypothesis? So again, what does it mean? It means that when information comes, prices change. They change the right way, up or down, but they also change very quickly. So we need to choose a trading strategy and implement it over a large sample. So let's say we pick an asset pricing model like CAPM, and we measure the required return of the strategy's investments. Then you measure the actual return. So is the actual greater than the required? If so, that would reject the efficient market hypothesis. It says you can earn more than what the risk says. Now, there's two points here, and I've mentioned this in some previous videos, although probably wasn't real clear about it, but this is really a joint test. We are looking at the particular asset to see if the test rejects the uh, efficient market hypothesis. We're, we're testing our strategy, if you will. But what an additional aspect of that, though, or a reason for us rejecting the hypothesis could be that the asset pricing model is wrong. So there is what we refer to as the weak form hypothesis. Current prices already reflect all information contained in past prices. So if you're looking at past prices, you cannot earn excess returns with strategies that are based on those past prices. So this is looking at historical information. So if you invest in stocks that have declined below their 52-week low, right, that's your strategy, right? Everything below their 52-week low, we're going to buy those stocks. This is a type of technical analysis, but the question is, can you make excess returns from this? And that's critical, right? Doesn't say you can't make profit, but when you incorporate things like taxes, uh, commissions, right, can you still make a profit that is above what the market earns based on the risk level of the stocks? So this empirical evidence for the weak form basically says, look, it supports this idea. There are very few trading strategies that can consistently earn in excess of the capital asset price and model prediction. Now, there are two exceptions, right, uh, with very small excess returns. Looking at what they refer to as short-term momentum, uh, if you were to calculate a correlation on a daily basis. Is today's price related to the previous price? This is a measurement of momentum. So that might be, there, there could be some strategies to work there. And also if there are some long-term reversals. Now this is what we refer to as technical analysis. This is what those charters, right? The people looking for this graphically, this, these are the things that they're looking for that they trade on. So what do we know? In general, using historical information cannot gain you extra knowledge to beat the capital asset pricing model prediction. What about the semi-strong form of efficient market hypothesis? This looks at all public available information. So it does look a historical thing, but it looks, quite frankly, at current events, right? Basically, it says, look, you cannot earn excess returns with strategies based on information from financial statements or other public sources. I think about current events. So if you invest in stocks with past three-year earnings growth greater than 10%, and a ratio of research and development to sales greater than 10%. That's your strategy. Calculate the capital asset pricing model on that particular strategy for those companies. 
And this is what we refer to fundamental analysis, looking at the company's story. If the semi-strong uh, form is efficient, you still cannot beat the capital at pr asset pricing model's prediction of prices. So what does evidence show us? Again, most evidence supports this efficiency. In fact, the vast majority of portfolio members do not consistently have returns in excess of capital asset pricing model. Now, there's always some exceptions to the rule, right? But there are two things in particular that we uh, need to be aware of. Number one, small companies tend to out earn large companies when we adjust for this capital asset pricing model uh, required return. In addition, companies with high book to market ratios also tend to outperform those with low book to market ratios. Now everybody knows what these companies are. So you would think that if people know what a small company is and they know they earn excess returns, you would think that people would drive money in that direction, which would also eventually do what? Increase the prices, which would then lower the returns but we don't find that to be true. So these are what we sometimes refer to as anomalies. There's something else at work here. One of the things that is uh, put forward, if you will, to try to explain this is that there is another form of risk. It's not just beta that we have to be worried about. There's something else at work that beta doesn't capture. So there are some capital asset pricing model theories, uh, versions, if you will, that incorporate something else. There's something called the Fama Macbeth three factor model. It looks at three things, one of which being beta, but it looks at those other things to try to explain what happens to returns. Now, the strong form hypothesis says any information you get, even inside information, is already in stock prices. So you cannot earn excess returns ever. Quite frankly, that's not true. Having inside information, by definition, gives you an added uh, step up, if you will, towards making profits. This is why inside information is illegal. I mean, quite frankly, if you know who's going to win because of something nobody else knows, you will always win yourself because you would never bet against something that you knew was true, right? If you knew it was true and you bet against it, then you would know you're obviously going to lose. So the strong form efficient market hypothesis essentially says inside information, if you use that, you won't, you will not, you actually will earn excess returns. And of course, that means that the market is not efficient. We talked a little bit about market bubbles or anomalies, right? Sometimes prices climb rapidly. For some reason, they're going up like crazy. Why are they going up? Maybe we have some trading volumes, unusually high. Well, why would trading volume be going up? What are investors doing, right? If there's lots of new investors or speculators, maybe that's driving the volume, which is driving the price change. So prices, once, uh, once people come to their sanity, right, why is this happening? Prices are going to suddenly fall. That's, that's the idea of bursting the bubble. Now, this did happen in 1999 to 2000. Some of you may recognize or, or remember the Y2K um, e events that happened. In 1999, there was huge pressure on the technology market. So technology stocks were driven up extremely high. There were mutual funds that invested in the technology sector that had a 100% return 
1999. Why is that? For some reason, investors were just insanely demanding and purchasing these technology stocks. But what happened was after Y2K didn't happen, after it didn't happen, people started to come to more a common sense type of analysis and they realized that they had paid too much. So then they started selling. Well, who actually made the most money? The people that made the most money are the people that had the best information. As soon as they figured out it was wrong, they started to sell right away. Other investors, those um, uh, with less information, were in too long and they could have lost a lot of money. So again, what this means is that there are times when investors drive the market. What does that mean about the efficient market hypothesis? It means that information is funny. Sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't, but how we react to information is what drives prices. So it says bubbles are hard to puncture, right? Why don't traders take positions that make big profits when the bubble bursts? First of all, it's hard to recognize it until after it actually does burst. So trading strategies can expose traders to possibly big negative cash flows if the bubble was a little slow to burst, right? What about the bottom line with respect to market efficiency? For most stocks, for most of the time, it's generally safe to assume that the market is reasonably efficient. Whatever price you see is a fair price. Many investors have given up trying to beat the market. This is why lots of investors invest in index funds. They don't want to pick individual stocks because they realize that they can't beat the market. Now, that doesn't mean they can't make money. It just means they can't beat the market. And again, we do know that bubbles happen, but they are infrequent when they do happen. What does that mean with respect to the capital asset pricing model? Empirical tests have some statistical problems. Most corporations use CAPM to determine their stock's required return. Most use, uh, researchers, however, use multi-factor models to identify the portion of the return that remains unexplained after we look at the model's factors. So on the research side, we use something a little bit more complicated, but on the corporate side, CAPM is still used primarily. So have has the capital asset pricing model been completely confirmed or refuted? And the answer is no. The statistical tests have problems and we understand them. As long as we understand the challenges, we can still utilize the tool. Most investors are still concerned about both standalone and market risk, primarily because they're not well diversified. So again, that's uh, a little bit of a brief discussion of the efficient market hypothesis and how prices change. Look forward to seeing you soon.